You are listening to American Ambassadors Live, the podcast on international affairs sponsored by the Council of American Ambassadors in Washington, D.C. The Council is the association of non-career U.S. ambassadors who have represented America under presidents from John F. Kennedy through Donald Trump. Our guest today is Ambassador Tom Siebert. Ambassador Siebert was ambassador to Sweden from 1994 to 1998. Uh, he's an attorney with over 30 years experience specializing in international business and government affairs in a range of industries uh, from IT, clean energy uh, to um, telecom and um, uh, renewable energy. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Ambassador Senator Jim, it's um, always a pleasure to be in your presence and uh, thank you for having me. What we're going to talk about today is sort of the big news in the Swedish American relationship which is uh, Sweden uh, deciding it wants to join NATO and NATO deciding it wants Sweden to join. So why don't we start at the beginning? Um, NATO has been around a long time and Sweden hasn't been a member of NATO. Uh, most European countries are members of NATO. Uh, for why for so long was Sweden not? Well, I was ambassador in the mid nineties, uh, Jim, and um, that was the period of time. Now, let me go back to the beginning because Sweden, when the alliance was first formed after World War II in the 1940s, neither the Swedes nor the Finns joined the alliance because they did not, they, they basically did not want to be involved in any kind of uh, military alliance that said, you know, if the Algerians attack the French, we, the Swedes, have to go help the French defend themselves. It's called Article Five, the Mutual Defense Pact, and that of was NATO. of NATO, and that was the central meaning and reason for NATO. So Sweden did not join in the 1940s, and they they took basically they developed a security policy back then, you know, uh, 50, 60 years ago, that was uh, uh, non-alignment in peace and neutrality in war. That has really been their uh, in their DNA forever. When I was ambassador in the mid-90s, 94 to 98, the Soviet Union had fallen. The Russian Federation was now reduced to 150 million people and uh, uh, it created uh, an opportunity to expand or enlarge the alliance. And that was what President Clinton did with a lot of we Europe, European ambassadors. Uh, this is the time when, for example, the, the little Baltic republics across the Baltic Sea, they all joined, and a lot of East European countries joined to the great chagrin of the Russians. Um, Sweden did not join, and I remember having long talks with their government officials, their foreign minister, and so forth, but I never over overpressed it because President Clinton did not believe it was essential that with respect to NATO enlargement, that the Swedes necessarily become full members of the alliance. Well, let me ask you this question. Yeah. You have the Polands and the Baltics and Hungary and Romania who um, bordered, definitely bordered the uh, former Soviet Union. The, the Baltics were in the former Soviet Union. Indeed they were. And, 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 and Sweden is right next to uh, Russia and by water, by land, why did the Swedes over these all these decades not feel the same need for the protection of NATO that all these other countries in Europe felt? I, you know, it's a great question, Jim. And the, the way I've always theorized it is Sweden was a very militant warlike country forever in their history. And not recently, though. Oh, no, no. Some 200 years ago, I think. Tell us a little Swedes, bit about that. I think the Swedes decided that being warlike and attacking, you know, neighbors like really the, the Russians, I mean, they attacked Ireland, I mean, they did all this stuff. They find, kindly find a felt, kind of felt that, that it was, this had reached a point of diminishing returns and they really wanted to stop it. So they just went into this, you know, uh, non-aligned, non neutral mindset. And uh, this is a country of 10 million people, you know, it's not, terribly diverse, like, I mean, we're very diverse in America, and most European countries are more diverse. They all pretty much think alike, and it worked well for them during those years, um, and so forth. 
They did, however, when I was ambassador, join Partnership for Peace, which you will probably remember, Jim, when you're ambassador in Romania, uh, roughly the same time. Mm -hmm. Partnership for Peace was basically NATO light. And we convinced them to go in and whenever there was a peacekeeping role, the Swedes participated in great numbers in that, so long as they were not fighters. And if you look at the way Dayton worked, the Dayton Peace Accords. Or in the former Yugoslavia. Former Yugoslavia. When when we brought, when re really uh, President Clinton and Richard Holbrook uh, brought peace to that, to that part of the world, the country that participated in greatest numbers compared to their, you know, when weighed against their population was Sweden. Uh -huh. And they did an extraordinary thing. And back then, I mean, look at the result. We, we, uh, uh, the Americans and their European allies stopped a hot war in Europe and nobody died. What an extraordinary foreign policy accomplishment that was. Sweden played a huge role in that. So I think over the years, they become more comfortable with, with being involved in NATO-like. I got you. Or what they call nato light um, back then. And by the way, uh, President Clinton urged the ambassadors to use the word, never use the word expansion of NATO. That's a, that's a bad word for the Russians. Use NATO enlargement. Oh, that's interesting. I, I never, I never that's heard the way, that. That's that the term we always use. Yeah, that is the term we always use, but I never, I, I never realized the significance of it. That's very interesting. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, well, so what changed Sweden's mind this year? This is really a mystery to me because I've, you know, I'm very close to the Swedish uh, government. Uh, their embassy. I live in Washington D.C. Their embassy is walking distance from my home, and uh, I engage with them a lot. Uh, Here's a, here's a quick story. The Russians invaded Ukraine on February 24th of this year. Within about 10 days, I started reading in Swedish press this talk about joining NATO. And my reaction was, and I talked to my counterpart back then, Derek Scherer, who was ambassador to Finland. I said, Derek, this is never going to happen, right? Oh, it'll never happen. It's not in their DNA. And I went to a dinner first week or so in March. And the former Swedish prime minister was at the dinner named Carl Bildt. And he's a, all of us who served in Europe, Jim, like you know, he's a, he's a very highly high profile player. He's former prime minister of Sweden, but a genius in foreign policy. And I met him at this dinner and I, I talked to him about it. And he said, you know, possibly it could happen. Maybe it could happen. And at the same dinner was the Swedish ambassador the extraordinary Karen Olaf's daughter. I asked her about it. She says, oh, it's possible. And then they sat me at the dinner next to the, uh, the new Finnish ambassador to the United States. And I had never met him before. Um, and uh, his name is Miko Otala. And all we did at this dinner was talk about NATO. And he, ga he gave me some encouragement. So long and short of it is that the the prevailing party over many years has been this, this, the Social Democratic Party in Sweden. They're, they're, they're more center left, you know, and the moderates are more center right. The moderates were all for NATO uh, 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 accession and so forth. But oh, no, 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 let's stop on that. So the moderate party, which is a more, a more of a center right party? Yes, yeah, more they center right. Traditionally for joining NATO? Well, let's put it this way. They were more accepting of the concept. Okay. I don't think they ever ran platforms because frankly, the Swedish, you know, the, the people in Sweden who had voted in these various parties were quite comfortable that they'd, since the late 1940s, never had to engage in wars. Right. You know? I mean, that's that's quite a an deal. accomplishment. Uh, even though I must always remind people, it, especially when they're listening to podcasts like this, Sweden is not Switzerland. Sweden is armed to the teeth. Uh, they have deep military roots. They always know, like the Finns, if somebody starts to come across these borders, they are ready to defend themselves. Uh, so in all these years, uh, Sweden got more comfortable because of Partnership for Peace. Right. I would say also with the, uh, uh, Sweden buys a lot of military armaments from the United States, from European countries, 
And one of the things that they had done over many of these years, which again makes them much more comfortable with possibly joining NATO, is they basically developed their own military uh, exports with a term called interoperability with NATO. Now there's all these weapons kind of fit into the NATO mix. So if it would ever happen. But Jim, your, your, your question was, uh, what was it that triggered this? And this was kind of amazing to me because there is a there is what I would call in American political language, a far right uh, party there called the, called the Sweden Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, don't get caught Thank up you. in terminology, Sweden Democrats. And they are really kind of an anti-immigration, a Sweden first, why mm -hmm. are we allowing people in from other countries, that kind of thing. And the very young leader of that party right after the invasion of Ukraine came out and said, I think we're ready to join NATO. Now that gave a lot of comfort to, because the Sweden Democrats for a lot of reasons had really risen in popularity among the Swedish government. I mean, the Swedish people uh, electorate. Yep. And so that, that was a thing that triggered it. Um, this, the, the moderates, the more elites in Sweden had always wanted to go into NATO. In kind of the social democrats who'd been had more power over many years than any of these other parties they became comfortable with it and that's what happened and so after that dinner that i had in uh, march here in washington um, with those swedish and finnish players next thing i know it had gained gained traction and we moved into the spring and it, it became very public that both you know stockholm and helsinki we're going to move forward with NATO uh, uh, applications. They're obviously neighbors of each other's and they have several things in common, not including language. Uh, not including language. There's nobody I know who's ever served in a diplomatic post in Finland who can speak Finnish. No, I understand. But, they want, try. <laughs> but was part of the dynamic that, that if they were going to join NATO, they, they'd do it together? Or was that happenstance? It was. From the first a discussion I had with the uh, former Prime Minister Bilt, he basically took the position that if they move, they should move in tandem. It'd be much more powerful. Remember, Finland, unlike Sweden, which is protected by the Baltic Sea, Finland has an 863-mile border with the Russians. Right. One of the reasons that the Russians, nobody messes with the Finns. The Russians do not want to take, they would never do like an open invasion into Finland because they look what's happening to them in Ukraine, my lord. Uh, you know they can't even advance their interests there. Uh, they'd get taken out. So uh, I just think probably it was just one of these concepts whose time had come, and the the I think I think this the Swedes also recognized that Russian aggression when it's manifest in the way it was, which is a cross-border invasion of a country like Ukraine that close to Sweden is something that they could face someday. I mean, let's say the, let's say the, um, uh, let's say Putin had moved in and really kind of taken over that country very quickly. That's something that would be great, very concerning to the Swedes, gotcha. the, the, you know, and so forth. Uh, so, so they they and the Finns made the decision they wanted to come into NATO. Yep. Overwhelming number of NATO countries said, we want you in. Of course. And then there was Turkey. Tell us about Turkey's objection. Turkey's problem with the Swedes goes back many years. Uh, I think, uh, just to give you a kind of a, a picture of this thing, um, back in, you know, the Turks, a lot of people don't know this, they're obviously members of NATO. They are not members of the European Union. Right. The reason for that is Turkey is located in a very rough neighborhood. They're kind of a nexus between Middle East and Russia and Eastern Europe. And uh, there was always a view uh, among the, certainly the Swedes and the Finns, but especially the Swedes, that the government in Turkey, in Ankara, 
really ran a very tough policy dealing with their minorities, especially Kurdistan, the Kurds, who are, it's really an extraordinary country in many ways. Uh, and during the kind of the, the shutdown of Kurdistan by Turkey, there were a lot of uh, asylum seekers, refugees. About, about when was that, the, the, the crackdown of the Kurds? Uh, oh, this is back in the 70s, 80s, okay. I believe. And, uh, and Sweden accepted a lot of Kurdish re refugees in their country. Uh, and, you know, the Turks have never forgiven them for it. There were also some very powerful journalists in Turkey who sought asylum outside the country because, you know, they could be killed. Um, or these, these, these were Kurdish journalists. Kurdish journalists, yeah. And a lot of what they wrote about was anti Ankara, it was anti Turkey. So they went to uh, they went to Sweden as well. So the and remember, uh, Turkey is run by Erdogan, who is a, you know, an autocratic leader. This is not, you know, an open democracy like we're used to. And uh, early on, when Sweden and Finland applied for NATO accession, um, Erdogan made a big deal about, you know, his concerns that he thought that they needed to earn their way in. Now, that's not really the way it goes, but that was his position. I might say so also that, and Jim, you'll recognize this as a former ambassador, you know, uh, to Romania, that there were four countries whose uh, representatives, whose ambassadors had full diplomatic security by SAPO, the Swedish Secret Service. Obviously me, the American, the British, the Israeli ambassador, and the Turkish ambassador. Now the Turks don't necessarily need uh, full uh, diplomatic security protection in most countries, in which their ambassadors serve, but in this one they did because the, the, the Kurdish population had grown sufficiently in Sweden that they used to come up near my embassy, our residence, the Turkish ambassador's embassy and residence was very close to ours. Uh, I knew her, Salma Yunidin, very well, brilliant, very effective diplomatic woman. Um, and they ran these, they had these they had these uh, all kinds of uh, uh, they had all kinds of um, uh, threats to the security of the ambassador because she was representative of the Turkish government. So, in any event, uh, this has gone on for a long time, and even in the last, uh, actually, the last several hours, I pulled an article just a while ago that er uh, Erdogan, the, the Turkish uh, president has now said that he is going to try to extract further concessions from the Swedish government regarding their policy because they they basically were a safe haven for the PKK, which is this outlawed anti-Turkish uh, political uh, party. Kurdish party. Uh, yeah, it's a Kurdish party, but anti-Turkish right. in all of respect. So that's going on, and they've, they've talked, just to conclude this, Jim, they've talked, the Turkish um, uh, president, Erdogan, has now said that, that he is looking for concessions and will deal with it after the first of the year. So he has not yet relented in approving, uh, in approving Sweden's accession into NATO. And for someone to come into NATO, you have to have unanimity right. among all the, whatever it is, 26 countries. So, so is, is there a similar issue with Finland or not? Not. The Turkish issue is with Sweden, not Finland. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, is it conceivable that Turkey just won't go along or they won't make a deal and Finland will come in and Sweden won't? You know, Jim, I, I think it's conceivable, but I think it's highly unlikely. I mean, re remember, the, the Turks are in a very bad neighborhood. They've never been accepted into the European Union, which they would greatly love. Right. It would give them so much more economic power and so forth. For them to play this kind of hardball with the NATO alliance, where they're a significant player, mm -hmm. because they've got a personal issue with Sweden. I mean, one, one, of the, one of the things that they've demanded are these, 
you know, Erdogan, the president, really wants those journalists returned, mm -hmm. they'd be killed. They'd certainly be jailed for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Sweden would never compromise on that. There is no way the Swedes would ever say, okay, NATO's a bigger value to us. We're going to we're going to throw we're going to throw these 13 journalists to the wolves. Gotcha. They would never do that. Interesting. Last question. Uh, but the U.S. Um, has ratified uh, their their accession into into NATO. Yes, they have, and it was never. I thought. I I don't think it was ever uh, in doubt. But uh, I'm very close to the this wonderful Swedish ambassador here, Karin Ola's daughter, who has been ambassador to the United States from Sweden since about 2017, and I know that uh, uh, I spoke with her in early June at length about her plans. And she said, well, I have to, the U.S. requires Senate ratification for any addition to a, a treaty that we're involved in. And she said, it's my duty, this is Karen speaking, the ambassador, it's my duty to make sure we do a great showing in the United States Senate. And she had told me that she was going to spend virtually all of June and July before the ratification vote at the end of July, making sure that she talked to every U.S. senator. And she went there and um, that vote came through to approve accession 95 to one. 95, Terrific. 95, almost all the Republicans voted for it. Um, Rand Paul, who's a libertarian voted present, but he didn't vote against it. Uh, and only this uh, Senator from Missouri, Josh Hawley voted against it. So I referred to Ambassador Olaf's daughter now is ambassador 95 to one because okay. Jim, we know American politics, nothing ever happens in the United States Senate with a vote of 95 to one. Indeed, no, I, and I can see how that kind of vote would be seen in, in Sweden as a, a real a real vote of confidence in in, in Sweden as a member of the oh, tremendous. Oh yes, overwhelming. Interesting. Ambassador Siebert, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jim. It's always great, uh, great to see you again and I shall see you uh, down the road again, I'm sure. Thanks a lot. This is Ambassador Jim Rosenpep for American Ambassadors Live podcast. This has been the American Ambassadors Live podcast. To hear more from us, subscribe to the American Ambassadors Live podcast and leave us a review. Tweet us your thoughts on this week's episode and tag us at AMERAmbassadors using the hashtag AmbassadorsLive.